hello and welcome to this second webinar in a series of four webinars about how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. My name is Julie McCrossan and I was treated for stage four throat cancer, oropharyngeal cancer in my tonsils, tongue and throat uh, in 2013 and I was treated with radiation and chemo. And this series is hosted by SAMRI, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, and the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research. And that centre is being built in Adelaide, uh, even as we speak. Let me begin by acknowledging that I'm broadcasting to you from Aboriginal land, uh, the land of the Gadigal people, because I'm in Sydney. And I'm joined right now in the land of the Ghana people in Adelaide by Shona Edwards, uh, who's a young woman treated with proton therapy. And that's our topic again tonight. Uh, treated in Prague in 2018 and uh, Shona's uh, active with Canteen and also on the youth advisory group of the South Australian uh, Youth Cancer Service. Welcome Shona and thank you for joining us again. We heard your story on our first webinar last week. Uh, can I just ask you, I know you've sh uh, shared that interview, I, it's over, got over a, a hundred views already. Any feedback you've been getting from your friends and mates who've had a look at it? It's, um, it's a strange thing to see yourself on camera, I think, but um, I've heard from a few people, you tend to, when you're a patient speaking, you tend to hear from other patients and it's always people you never expect or people who've had their lives touched by cancer. So it's lovely to connect with those people over that. And I know you said your motivation is to try and uh, improve the experience for other people who may face uh, similar challenges to yourself. And indeed, that's my motivation as well. And this whole series of four webinars is talking to members of multidisciplinary cancer teams and also to people who've been treated for cancer and their families about how can we improve treatment and recovery. The first two, and today is the second one, are about proton therapy, and you'll hear all about that in a moment. Our third webinar is about conventional radiation therapy with a focus on children, adolescents, and young people, and what people are doing to improve the treatment there. And our final one in this series is about closing the gap for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when it comes to uh, cancer survival and uh, equally importantly, really, quality of life. So, as I said, our topic today is proton therapy. In our first webinar, we heard from University College London Hospitals who are opening a proton therapy unit in London later this year as well as hearing from Shona about her experience in Prague. We're going back to the United Kingdom now to one of the Rutherford Cancer Centres, which are a network of private sector cancer treatment centres. Well, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome Professor Carol Sikora, uh, the Chief Medical Advisor for the Rutherford Cancer Centres in the United Kingdom, an oncologist and uh, former Chief of the World Health Organization's Cancer Program and a founder uh, of the company running the Rutherford Cancer Centres. Uh, welcome, Professor Ka uh, Carol Sikora. What is proton therapy and what do you see as the, the key potential benefits for improving results for some cancer patients? So proton therapy is just a form of radiotherapy. The actual end product is very similar to conventional radiation. About half of all cancer patients get radiotherapy at some point in their journey with cancer. The advantage of protons is in a very small percentage of patients, probably around 10%, where the anatomy of the cancer and the anatomy of the normal tissue surrounding it is such that by using protons which stop the radiation energy stops in the body, you get much better delivery to the cancer without damaging surrounding normal tissue. So different parts of the body, you get different effects. Children's tumors, brain tumors, esophageal cancer, uh, left-sided breast cancer because of the heart underneath, and a variety of abdominal and pelvic tumors. It, it's really two different types of plan are made, one with conventional, one with protons, and if the protons are better, let's go with the protons to spare the long-term complications of radiotherapy. 
And the idea is very much we select people, we have a panel that we discuss the cases, we review the, the images, the CT scans, the MR scans, and then calculate whether there would be a significant advantage of protons. I mean, the, the, the timing, the, 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 the mechanism of delivery, the sort of how the machine behind me looks like, it's very similar to a conventional. There's not really much difference. And the immediate side effects are very similar. The key to the future is the other long-term side effect. Protons, because they stop in tissue, um, it, basically they have far less long-term side effects on tissues beyond the cancer because they stop in the cancer, basically. The whole of radiotherapy is about making the delivery more precise. And so all sorts of tools, better imaging, better ways of visualizing the cancer, that's a great help. Better information technology, the IT systems are fantastic now to demonstrate where the radiation is going. And better equipment for delivery, like the machine behind me. We can, this is a massive machine, you can't see most of it, it's all hidden behind the panels. But it can deliver millimeter accuracy, uh, radiation which kills cancer cells just within a millimeter of where you want it to go. So everything has to be precisely aligned. What do you see as the role of the private sector? You, you've expressed there a concern about the delay in the translation of research into clinical practice. Do you see the private sector as leading in innovation? What is your approach there? So, so I've worked in the public sector for, for 40 years as a physician and it's, it's sort of great to come into the private sector because it's far more innovative and you know in Australia you've got a, a healthy mixed economy of public and private providers not just for cancer but for the, all your health care. I think the partnership model is far the best one. Uh, we can do in the private sector, we can get capital funding easily, we can build things quickly, we don't have the bureaucracy and we can move forward with innovation. So it's likely that many developments in the future in cancer and other uh, diseases will come in the private sector and then be used in the public sector, hopefully under partnership agreements. My final question for you is, if a patient is watching this and is being offered the option of conventional radiotherapy or proton therapy, and you've indicated conventional radiotherapy is developing in its precision as well. What sort of questions should they ask their oncologists to help them decide whether proton therapy is for them? Number one, will it increase the chances of cure for the cancer? And number two, will it reduce the chances of long-term side effects? These are the two questions. It may be that there won't be an increase in cure. Well, that's fine, provided there is going to be a reduction in long-term side effects. And, uh, you know, if the chances of success are high, say 80%, what you don't want 10 years on are side effects caused by the radiation. And the side effects you get with radiation critically depend on which part of the body is being radiated. So they're totally different from radiating the brain compared to the pelvic areas or down at the prostate or the bladder or somewhere like that. So uh, ask the physician what's the advantage. That's all that matters. Because even though it may be that insurers will pay the costs of protons, it may be much more inconvenient. You may have to travel to a right across Australia to get it, or even to another country. So it's always going to be more difficult and more inconvenient to get protons. But if there's an advantage, it's almost certainly worth doing. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thanks for giving us the time. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Tembi, who's a senior therapy radiographer uh, at uh, Thames Valley centre in the Rutherford Centre. Welcome uh, to this conversation with Australia. Can you just tell us what your job is? What do you do with proton therapy patients over there in the United Kingdom? Okay, hi, my name is Tembi, a senior therapy radiographer here at the Rutherford Cancer Centre in Thames Valley. So as a senior therapy radiographer, I'm involved in the patient's pathway, literally from diagnosis, um, up to end of treatment and follow up as well. Where are you standing now? What is that machine? And what happens when the patient comes in for proton therapy? 
What happens to them? Okay, so currently I'm standing in our Linak bunker. As you can see, this is the Proteus One machine um, that we use every day to deliver highly targeted, or should I say highly sculpted um, radiation doses to a precise um, tumor location inside, um, inside your bodies. Um, so what we do here is that we use um, protons, which is a different form of radiation therapy. So the properties of the high energy protons allows us to be able to deliver a targeted dose where it's needed the most and ensure there is no exit dose, unlike the conventional methods of radiotherapy treatment. So in us doing that, it has allowed us to deliver high dose um, radiation um, treatments. So it's the capability to dose escalate and the capability to actually minimize any injury to surrounding structures. And when the beam is, is uh, being used, does the patient feel anything? So this treatment is painless. The patient will not feel anything. You might hear some sounds, but that's literally from the machine, which is similar to conventional radiotherapy when you're moving the treatment machine around, but it's nothing um, significant to cause any sort of anxiety, should I say. Thank you. And how long have you been working in, in cancer care? So I've been working in cancer care since 2013 when I qualified um, and I have worked in different organizations, um, the national health system, I've worked in other organiza private organizations as well prior to coming here, um, use so many different technologies but to be fair I will say I absolutely love uh, Proton. I feel it, it just, you know, supersedes um, anything that I've used before. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it gives me great pleasure now uh, to welcome Mike Moran, MBE, who's the CEO of the Rutherford Cancer Centres in the United Kingdom and founder and you've been an executive in the healthcare and defence industries, uh, senior executive for many years. Thanks for talking to us. Can you just begin with a sort of snapshot overview of where the Rutherford centres are in the United Kingdom and why you see the network and the placement of the network as crucial to what you're trying to do to improve the experience for patients and families? Yeah, well, thank you, Julie, and thank you for inviting me onto this channel to talk. So we have four centres across the UK. Uh, the first centre to be operational in the UK for proton beam therapy was in Newport, South Wales. And as we were building that centre, we had three other projects on the go. So Northumberland in the northeast, Thames Valley, where I am today, in the south, and uh, Liverpool in the northwest. And all of our centres deliver, um, well, the centres of excellence, they deliver a, a whole gambit of services from imaging, which includes ultrasound, mammography, MRI, CT. Then we do chemotherapy, so chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiotherapy, and of course, high energy proton beam therapy. And how many of your centres offer proton therapy now and in the future? So we have three centres fully operational for proton beam therapy in Newport, South Wales, Northumberland and where I am in Thames Valley. And of course, the machine is right behind me. They're all single room centres. So one cyclotron, one room. So that gives me great efficiencies across the network. And in our centre in Liverpool, later on this year, we'll rig the uh, fourth uh, uh, proton beam therapy machine. That will take then nine months to commission and then we'll be fully operational with Proton across the UK. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, your relationship as a private provider of cancer services, including proton therapy, with the National Health Service? Because you'd be aware here in Australia, we have clinicians uh, who work in both sectors, and that is a common practice, but I think it might be a little different for you in the United Kingdom. 
the relationship with the NHS is evolving. Um, COVID we see as a catalyst for change uh, for that to happen because the NHS required uh, more services from the private sector. But in particular, you know, all of our oncologists are NHS oncologists. They work with us on practice and privileges. So what we've done uh, to work with the NHS is we've educated a lot more oncologists. So I think we've had around 65 oncologists go through the uh, training program with the University Hospital Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So that's uh, at UPenn and that's around proton beam therapy training. So now in the UK, we've got significantly more oncologists trained in uh, proton beam therapy. But in terms of our direct relationship and contracts with the NHS, that's evolving every day. So we have a number of contracts for diagnostic work, for radiotherapy work, and for SACT, so systemic anti-cancer therapies like chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So we want to work closer with the NHS. We have a contract in Taunton. So in addition to our cancer offer, we're also building a network of diagnostic centers because in my thinking, it's really important to diagnose as early as you can and then seamlessly move and transition through into the treatment phase. So as soon as you diagnose cancer, you can then uh, seamlessly move in and treat patients. Well, look, Mike Miranda, thank you so much uh, for talking to us. It's just been really interesting to learn about the experience in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Take care. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Emma, who's joining us in the Proton Therapy Bunker at one of the Rutherford Cancer Centres, I think in Thames Valley. Welcome. Can you introduce yourself and explain what your job is there at the Rutherford Centre and and how we'd describe it here in Australia? Because I think the language is a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, sure. So I'm a senior therapeutic radiographer. In Australia, the equivalent is a radiation therapist. Um, And my role here is really to work both on standard conventional radiotherapy, but also with the proton beam machine as well. And from the point of view of a patient, how much of a difference is there between being treated with conventional radiation therapy or proton therapy? Can you give us a sense of from the patient and family point of view, how different is it? Um, Well, I guess the first main difference is the timing. So conventional radiotherapy can, you know, sometimes take anywhere from 15 to kind of half an hour, um, whereas your proton beam therapy typically takes a bit longer. Um, And that can be for multiple reasons. It's not so much that the treatment itself is longer, but actually the setting up process and the verification process can take some time. Because what we do is we've got a couple of different types of verification images on the proton machine. So we've got uh, comb beam CT, um, which allows us to have quite a large kind of field of view and a 3D view of what's going on inside. And then we also have KV imaging, which takes kind of a little snapshot to confirm position. So typically for a proton patient, I would always advise them that they'll probably be on the bed for about 45 minutes. Now it might seem like a really long time, but actually, All we're requiring the patients to do is lie on the bed and stay nice and still and breathe away normally. So in terms of what we're actually asking from the patients, it's very similar to your conventional therapy, just a little bit longer. Tell us a little bit about what you do to support the patients and family before the treatment and after the treatment, because my understanding is you manage to have a, a, uh, an ongoing relationship for the patient and family as they go through the process, is that correct? Exactly right. So before the patients come in for treatment, they obviously have to have their planning appointments where we create any immobilisation to keep them nice and still. So for example, for brain or head and neck patients, we would have the head and neck shell that keeps them nice and still. And sometimes for abdomen patients, we might create a vac bag, which is almost like a bean bag that we suck the air out of and it kind of keeps to the shape of their body. So when we have that appointment, we actually spend quite a lot of time with the person and with their family members if they'd like them to be present, explaining the procedure, 
reiterating you know what the potential side effects may be we talk through actually kind of what to expect with the treatment um, and what we do is we get baseline information from them so we don't just look at patients in terms of in terms of side effects we also look at them from a holistic point of view so we kind of evaluate how they're feeling um, you know if they have any worries about the treatment we look at you know emotional concerns spiritual concerns and um, what we do is then we get them in touch with the appropriate people so at the rutherford we have you know counselors available not just to the patients but also to their family members if they feel like they need that support We've got complementary therapies like reflexology. We have physiotherapists as well. So actually physiotherapy is a really upcoming kind of um, supportive care measure that's useful for a lot of patients because as I'm sure you're aware, fatigue is a really big side effect that we see from all types of cancer treatments. And gentle exercise is really, really good at helping to combat fatigue and minimize it. So our physiotherapists work really closely with our patients. We've also got dietitians, we've got speech and language therapists. We kind of have um, a multidisciplinary approach to kind of how we deal with patients and also their families to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and supported through the journey. Do you use play therapists uh, with younger children? We do, yes. So play therapy is really good at introducing children to medical procedures. So here in this centre, we actually have a playroom that's been built specifically for young children. And in that playroom, we have things like, we have what we call a kitty scanner. And basically it's a scanner built by Philips and it's a, it's a small version of what our big CT scanner is. And it comes with these little toys. They're like little, um, we've got like a crocodile, an elephant, a duck, and they have a little chip in them. So what you do is with the child, you get the teddy bear and you pop it into the scanner and the scanner registers that it's actually got that teddy bear in there. And on a big TV screen, it pulls it up and explains kind of, you know, what you can expect from a scan and it's got a little cute story with it. Look, just before I let you go, can you just very briefly explain where the bed is, where the patient lies and possibly in their sort of bean bag that's got the air sucked out of it and where the beam comes from, just so people get a sense of what, you know, how it's delivered, the proton therapy. Sure. So um, the patient will lie on this bed here. It's a carbon fibre couch. It's got a few different attachments that we can use depending on the body site. And it's pretty similar to the kind of couch top that you would use in conventional radiotherapy. Now this couch top is then attached to a robotic arm and the robotic arm can move on different angles to be able to get to the right treatment position. The treatment comes out of the head of the machine here. So all of our protons are coming out of this central bit here. Now, I don't know if you can see in the background, but um, this white kind of almost treadmill looking thing here is what we call the gantry. And this can actually rotate the head of the machine all the way round to the bottom. And um, these here are some imaging panels. So they're what we use to take verification images. And how long have you been working in the United Kingdom and are you coming back to Australia? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I left home in 2019. So I've been in the UK for nearly three years now. Um, and yes, in coming years, I would like to come home and kind of continue my work in Australia. Hopefully by then Protons will be open. So um, I can come and keep doing work with Protons. I just have a British partner, so I have to get him on board to move over first. <laughs> Well, look, thank you so much for giving us time, particularly during COVID. We, it, it, absolutely fantastic to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for talking to me. And there we were hearing from a, a range of people working at the Thames Valley Rutherford Cancer Centre. And if you've just joined us, this is our second webinar on proton therapy as part of a series of four webinars uh, offered by SAMRI, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute and the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research. And uh, joining us again is Shona Edwards, who was treated in Prague in 2018 uh, with proton therapy for, I think, a sarcoma on the base of your spine. That's what it was, Shona, wasn't it? Um, it's a papillary meningioma. There's too many omas. <laughs> Could you say that again slowly because I got it wrong? It's a papillary meningioma and it's at my sacrum the base of my spine. Thank you, but my apologies. And listening to that, as someone who's had this treatment, 
two or three things that interested you or that you thought were positive and worth underlying in what we just heard there from the Rutherford Cancer Centre? Sure. So I'm glad they mentioned the word uh, inconvenient, because if there's one word I could use to describe my travel to Prague, it's it was very inconvenient. But obviously the um, huge advantages over the long term uh, make it worthwhile. Um, they also mentioned the patient's pathway um, and having a consistency of the provider that's with you through the whole experience. So you have that ongoing relationship, which I think is a fantastic way to avoid um, feeling lost, um, which is you know, and they're providing a seamless transition from diagnosis to treatment. That would be fantastic to avoid the distress of not knowing what's coming next. I was also interested that they mentioned physiotherapy because that played a big part in your recovery when you came back to Australia from Prague. Do you want to just explain that for people who didn't see your first interview? Sure. So I had uh, quite severe issues with mobility because of uh, pain during my treatment. So um, it would have been fantastic to have um, the ongoing uh, physiotherapy through treatment, but unfortunately, because of the travel, it was all a bit uh, disjointed. So it would be fantastic to have that um, consistency across your whole experience. I think that would give a huge advantage to patients. And for people who aren't aware, uh, while proton therapy is not currently available in Australia, uh, there is a government scheme. And if a clinical team believes that a person, particularly a young person like Shona, uh, could significantly benefit from proton therapy. You can get support from the government to travel internationally. That's the nub of it, isn't it, Shona? Absolutely. That's the system I went through. Just before we, we, we meet uh, uh, another Australian who's had a year's experience working in proton therapy in the United Kingdom, uh, I, I, I know myself as a cancer patient once I became a bit of an advocate, I began to learn an awful lot more about my condition and about my treatment. And I just wonder for you, two years, is it now three years after treatment, what, are you, what new things are you learning about proton therapy that you think are quite significant? I have to admit, uh, you know, at the moment, in the moment, you've just been diagnosed, you're, you're waiting for treatment, you're not sure where you'll go. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to actually learn what was really happening to me um, until after. So I've benefited from how fantastic these providers are at explaining what actually happens um, it, with the actual science of it. So, so do I'm you? Even now. I, I was just thinking that you're learning retrospectively what happened. Yes, I mean you sort of you sort of know, but it's almost like it's not your priority. <laughs> You've got other things on your mind at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Shona, uh, let's travel again now uh, to the United Kingdom and we're going to hear about proton therapy, this time a service run by the National Health Service in Manchester, up in the north in the United Kingdom. Well, it is just so exciting now to meet a radiation oncologist who's had experience of proton therapy in the United Kingdom. Do you mind just introducing yourself giving us a little bit of background uh, about yourself as a radiation oncologist, but then tell us what took you to the Christie and the focus of your work there. Yeah, sure. So my name's Unji Huang. I had uh, completed my radiation oncology training in Sydney, um, and I was fortunate enough actually to be awarded the Thomas Baker grant through the college that I specialise through, and that affords uh, someone to go overseas for extra experience. Um, and my post through that was at the Christie Proton Therapy Centre, uh, which is the only operational NHS funded high energy proton therapy centre in the UK. Um, and so I had first hand experience in working with patients uh, receiving proton therapy. Uh, it was an invaluable experience. As you know, with proton therapy coming to Australia, there has to be work in preparation, in training up the necessary people for that. Um, and so my hope was to really bring back some expertise and also see what people around the world are doing very well in this space. Look, before I ask you the key questions I have for you to deepen the knowledge of our, our viewers uh, to what proton therapy is and its potential benefits to certain types of cancer patients, just off the top of your head, what are the three key things you'd tell uh, a fellow radiation oncologist that you've learnt about proton therapy? 
Okay, a fellow radiation oncologist. Yeah. So I would say that I view proton therapy as another tool in the radiation oncology sort of toolbox or tool belt. It has its place and its purpose for specific tumors and in specific patients. Um, I like to emphasize its uh, yeah, potential promise, as you said, Julie, um, and the exciting uh, possibility of it reducing side effects in patients, particularly in our younger patients. Um, yeah, but th- th- that's really what I would focus on. So there's a, it, it's cautious, it's qualified, but it's optimistic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> my understanding is that we have to understand dose distribution to fully understand the potential benefits Mm -hmm. of proton therapy and you've got a diagram there can you show me on the diagram what this dose distribution is all about and why it's so crucial so I think it is best explained through a diagram rather than using lots of words to try and explain what this graph shows Um, but this shows really the difference between conventional radiotherapy as it enters the human body and proton beam therapy. And so if you look at this green line, this is conventional photon or X-ray therapy. And when it enters the patient, it is highly penetrative, but it deposits most of its dose maximally within the first few centimeters upon entering the patient. And then eventually it does reach the tumor or the target here. But as you can see, there is quite a bit of normal tissue preceding that tumor, what's called organ here that will receive some radiotherapy and also beyond that tumour, what's called exit dose. In comparison with a proton beam, which there's two versions here, basically this shows one um, proton beam and this is modified to join them together to create a a spread out Bragg peak. But just in simple terms, when you look at the proton beam, it enters the patient, it's a charged heavy particle. And when it enters the patient, there's less dose or low dose as it enters the patient and it actually deposits most or if not most of its dose in this region called the Bragg peak. Following that there is a sharp drop off. Okay now why is that terribly good for patients? Yeah so it's potentially potentially (laughs) because if we can determine and manipulate the Bragg peak to be in the region of the tumour then in In many ways, we're getting our bang for our buck here while sparing normal tissue before and after where that tumour dose is being given. So in a nutshell, you must be now doing research, these new teams with proton therapy. You're working on getting the maximum beam to hit the tumour and do as little damage as possible going in and hopefully no damage going out. (laughs) That's the nub of it. But some people, once proton therapy is in Australia, will still be getting normal conventional radiation therapy. So this is a slightly challenging graph, isn't it? Well, I mean, we have to take it in the context that um, this is in its purest form. You know, in the real world space, um, every tumour, depending on its location and its size, the bigger the tumour and depending on the location of that tumour, proton therapy may not afford this benefit that we're seeing on this graph. We start losing that benefit, the larger the tumour, for example, and in terms of its location, its proximity or its closeness to other very critical structures, if it's still very close, we can't spare even with proton therapy because we still need to get that dose in. So all within context, um, and each case needs to be Um, looked at individually, which is why I like to see proton therapy as a separate tool, not necessarily one to replace conventional radiotherapy. I guess the big hope that a number of the people we've interviewed have talked about is the reduction in long-term side effects. Indeed, one of the radiation oncologists or one of the doctors has said the side effects initially may be pretty similar for many patients to conventional radiation therapy, but the hope is that the long-term side effects will be significantly reduced. Is that based on modelling or on clinical research? Tell us what the strength of that evidence is. I think that it's a bit of both. Um, The reason that um, that's been said uh, is because the low and medium doses we're seeing are the ones being reduced, whereas those high doses to those normal structures that are 
very close to where we're targeting, are difficult to spare with any form of radiotherapy, just by pure geographics of where things are anatomically. So the low and medium doses are, are shown to be reduced in dosimetric modelling, um, and that we know equates to late effects. Late effects meaning decades, um, which is why the interest group really for this form of therapy are the paediatric and the teenage young adults because they have many years to manifest these late effects. So that's really where the strength of um, the advantage of proton therapy lies. I, I think that diagram and the Bragg peak has illustrates so well the great potential reduction in long-term side effects for some patients if they have proton therapy, as I understand it, because there could well be less damage to surrounding healthy tissue. But in each individual patient case, there may be characteristics of that patient or the tumour or its location that will mean the pure benefit is not realised. And I wonder if it's possible to tell us a few examples to illustrate the, sign, the kind of difficult judgments a, a team of a multidisciplinary team will be making when they look at an individual patient in Australia and decide, will we give this patient conventional X-ray therapy or will we get them on an aeroplane to Adelaide mm -hmm. because we think proton therapy will be better for them? Yeah. Because sometimes it won't be an easy black and white decision, will no. it? No. And often that decision is actually d uh, dependent on what we see when we sort of map out what happens potentially within the body in terms of the doses if proton therapy was given. And what we're seeing in dosimetric studies is really that lower dose or the medium doses, not the high doses, the low and medium doses being reduced with proton therapy compared to conventional radiotherapy. And whether or not that makes a difference is, as you said, a very a clinical judgment depending on each case, particularly to do with the size of the tumour, but also the location of the tumour. I guess an example sort of just off the top of my head is that if there was a tumour right down at the bottom of the spine in a young female, let's say, then that tumour, because of its proximity to the nerve roots of the spine, it might be that when you compare conventional radiotherapy with proton therapy, the dose to the spine, because it's sitting right on it, in that case, is comparable. But the dose, let's say, slightly further away in the pelvis, and for someone who's a young female, it may be of great concern to them about the dose to the ovaries, which only need a very small dose to be affected, and that can have fertility impacts. So it might not be that we're sparing the higher dose around the actual target itself, but the lower doses in the pelvis, a little while away, but still fairly close by, is reduced. But the clinical consequence of that can be quite significant. Another example may be we do treat tumours in the region in, inside the head called the base of skull, which is where the brain sits, and there can be these rare tumours called sarcomas that, that emerge there. Again, the nerve roots around that area may be similar in terms of the dose they receive with radiotherapy conventionally and proton therapy, but the hearing apparatuses or the hearing structures that we use for hearing, uh, called the cochleas, a little while away from there if the size of the tumour is appropriate and they may be spared compared to having conventional radiotherapy. These are probably my two best examples right now. Thank you and, and it allows us to see some of the complexity of the judgments. I want to come to the issue of research because there are these contentious debates within the radiation community happening I think within Australia about the relative merits of the increasingly precise and sophisticated conventional radiation therapy options and proton therapy and there's big debates happening about that. What are some of the key research questions that are going to need to be addressed in these first years of proton therapy in Australia? And what are the arrangements to ensure we're all collecting data within Australia and hopefully internationally in a common way so we're building up a body of knowledge that can benefit the patients in five and ten years' time? Sure, yeah, that's a big question, Julie. 
So there is some data out there about proton therapy, um, but the skeptics will uh, say, understandably so in many regards, that the data is insufficient. Uh, so there is an ongoing effort now and into the future about collecting the necessary data. And I think really the data priorities in this space are to do with outcomes. So outcomes in terms of survival and local control, you know, how good are we at controlling tumours um, and how are people surviving with the proton therapy? Also, though, patient reported outcomes, so the patient experience in receiving proton therapy and the logistics around that but also, of course, the side effects or the toxicity outcomes, what we call, um, in terms of early and late effects. I think it is important for us to be able to coordinate on a national and an international level the type of data that we collect because it really gives us an opportunity once we can collate those patient and those tumour characteristics to make more meaningful uh, conclusions and mine that data in a more meaningful way. And is that collaboration occurring already in Britain. We, we've interviewed, uh, you were working at the Christie in Manchester uh, at, when you were a fellow there, and we've interviewed people at the Christie, and we've also interviewed people at University College Hospital London, is it University College London Hospital's proton therapy unit, and they're talking about um, collecting common data. So, is, so can we be optimistic as patients and families that you're all working together to get the best data? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the UK is a, a great example of that. Um, having only opened really operational protons um, through the NHS system in the last few years, the UK has recognised very sensibly that collecting data uh, consistently and um, conscientiously from the outset is very important to contribute to the literature that's growing about proton therapy. And having two national centres um, to try and coordinate that effort is going to only exponentially maximise what sort of data they're getting. Um, so yes, I, I know firsthand that um, the data that they're collecting, they're making sure that the nomenclature or the data items they're collecting are consistent and the types of things they're collecting are also consistent. Can you explain what a patient registry is in the cancer research world and then tell us what's happening there with proton therapy? Yeah, so a patient registry really provides an opportunity for every patient that's receiving proton therapy to have their details uh, collected. This you know, in terms of their patient characteristics, in terms of their tumour characteristics and their treatment characteristics. The importance of that is that it really maximises each patient's treatment as an opportunity to collect data about protons which we need. Um, the reason I think that that's most important is it's collecting real world evidence, isn't it, in terms of what's actually happening. We can look at graphs all day, I suppose, but looking at the clinical effects of what's actually happening when we deliver these this treatment to real patients um, and, you know, using that as a, a resource to be able to mine that data and, again, make meaningful conclusions. So is one set up in Australia already, do you know? Yeah, so that's a, a huge effort um, that's being um, put together in terms of making sure that when the centre is operational, um, that first Australian centre in Adelaide, that there is a, a a corresponding patient registry that's ready to go to collect that data. The overall theme of these uh, webinars is, you know, what can we do to improve the p radiation experience, including proton therapy, the radiation experience for patients and families. And we have done a whole feature on the Christie. Uh, but as someone who spent, I think, a year there uh, working, three or four of the things they're doing there that you think really add benefit uh, to patients, particularly the the children, adolescents and yeah. young adults. Yeah, no, they're doing lots of great things there, um, which I'm sure you saw as well as you've interviewed people there. I think the really the key thing that they're doing well is really their holistic approach to their care and management of patients, particularly children. And this goes from looking at details such as providing accommodation for people who live far away, and this is weeks of treatment, sometimes you know, five, six, seven weeks of treatment, providing accommodation um, that's funded for them, accommodation, oh sorry, so accommodation as also as transport daily to receive their treatment. There's also a school provided within the centre so that education um, is being continued for the children in as, you know, as 
a sort of similar way as back home. Um, equally, they really designed the space thoughtfully to be appropriate for paediatrics. There's also a separate corner for teenage young adults. Um, and I think of another crucial thing that they've um, incorporated within their staffing is someone called a key worker. And this is not necessarily someone who's uh, nursing trained or radiation therapy trained, it can be either or, but it's someone who really walks through a treatment journey uh, consistently with the parent and their family or an adult, um, and it becomes a familiar face and a real point of contact for patients who are trying to navigate all these different cogs um, within their treatment journey. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much. You know, it's just been enormously interesting to get the benefit of your uh, experience in the United Kingdom. Were you glad you uprooted yourself and went to the Christie to learn about this new technology? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Even though, you know, during global pandemic times, not something I expected and it did cut my time slightly short. Um, but the, the experience I had there, the knowledge that I feel like uh, I was exposed to and was involved in, in the clinical care and just seeing how, how well they're doing, um, implementing a lot of what we've talked about from the outset, um, I wouldn't have changed anything. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. And uh, Unji Wang referred there to the Christie. Of course, that's uh, the experience she was discussing. And if you'd like to see uh, our program, our webinar, where we interviewed members of the team at the Christie, if you Google SAMRI webinar, SAMRI stands for the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. So SAMRI, S-A-H-M-R-I webinar, uh, you'll get through uh, to the YouTube channel where all our interviews are and indeed our interviews today will be there as well. Well, Shona Edwards is back with us, who's had proton therapy herself. What what uh, struck you there? What stood out for you there in Unji Wang's discussion, Shona? She just gave such a fantastic description there of what's actually happening in the process. Um, and what she described about that theoretical female patient with a tumour in the pelvis fits my situation exactly. So thanks to proton therapy, as opposed to conventional, um, I'll possibly be able to have children in a relatively normal family life in the future and in the long term. So proton therapy is about survival, of course. It's about minimising the distress during the process, but it's also about quality of life for the patients afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it just shows how every tumour is different. So every patient is going to require careful planning to work out how and what they need. Can I just say, Shona, I do respect you for coming on these first two webinars about proton therapy and exposing yourself to all this information and reflection because on the one hand, you turn your intellect to it and your understanding, but there, there's also an emotional impact, isn't there, when you're hearing examples that mirror your own uh, direct experience. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And look, there was reference there to patient reported outcomes. And I was treated eight years ago. I, I haven't had direct experience of that. When you were in Prague, was there any way of you reporting your thoughts and feelings while you were being treated? Well, uh, we had a similar situation that Uji Wang described there, that we had, there was a key worker in the patient coordination team. So I was seeing that person every day um, and she was checking in with us. So at any point when we had issues, she was ready to help. So we had that point of care. And then afterwards, um, the MTOP program that uh, facilitated my travel there, um, they did follow up of to a review to see uh, feedback for the patients who get sent in that program. So there is a process there for feedback. Okay, fantastic. And I, I know work is being done all over Australia on patient reported outcomes. So it's, uh, I think it is going to become the norm, uh, even though I don't think it is yet. Well, look, I just want to let everybody know that uh, our next webinar, the third in our series, which is on Thursday, the 3rd of June, Thursday, the 3rd of June, 7.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time, is about children, adolescents and young adults. Shona, you're a young adult, that's how I think of you now. Uh, this is going to focus on conventional uh, radiation therapy in all its forms, but particularly looking at what Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, uh, Adelaide Women's and Children's Hospital are doing in partnership uh, with the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and also uh, the Cancer Centre for Children at Westmead, west of Sydney. What they're all doing, particularly to improve the radiation experience 
uh, for children and, uh, and their families for the conventional radiation therapy. So here's just a little taste. Here's a family that we'll meet at Westmead at our next webinar. Would you just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your son and the condition that brought him here to have cancer treatment? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Santosh and, and it's my wife, Shireen, and our son, Devanch, right? Uh, so Devanch was diagnosed with um, stage four high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, interestingly, um, pretty much on his third birthday, he spent his third birthday in hospital being diagnosed. Uh, it was almost a chance finding uh, because he had a sort of a lump on his, um, on top of his collarbone. Um, and, and, you know, after a couple of visits um, to the GPs, we were referred to Westmead Children's Hospital. Uh, and after a series of scans, um, we were, the diagnosis was made. Um, so, so how long ago was that? So this was about 12 months ago. So we've been uh, 12 months into treatment uh, now, and we've got a couple of more months to go. Okay. And, and do you mind telling me just uh, the sort of treatment your son's been having? Or I should say Spider-Man, because at the moment he is Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the treatments he's having? So he's having uh, what, what um, is known as the multimodal treatment. So, you know, it's the, the work. So we started with uh, chemotherapy uh, and then we had a resection surgery uh, to get the uh, primary tumour out, whatever was remaining of it. Uh, then we had, um, uh, you know, high dose chemotherapy with stem cell uh, rescue, also known as bone marrow transplant, um, followed by radiation. Uh, and then we're currently doing uh, immunotherapy, which seems to be one of the newer sort of treatments available. Look, the purpose of this series of videos is to share good ideas about what makes the experience of particularly radiation treatment uh, better for the young patient and their family. And my understanding is that your son managed to have radiation without a general anaesthetic, even though you're a young, very young man. Um, so what do you think made it possible for your son to have radiation treatment without a general anaesthetic? What helped you and him that much? Yeah. Okay. So um, I feel uh, the support workers, they helped a lot and uh, the social workers. So um, support workers um, in the sense like when he came in for the radiation, the support workers were there for, with the toys and they did a dummy, um, we did a dummy um, run. run as well. And when you say a dummy run, what do you mean? Yeah, um, so yeah, Woody. Said, you know, Woody? Woody, yeah. Yeah, we got Woody uh, <laughs> we got lying Woody on the <laughs> Lying on the bed and then, um, yeah, operating the machine and he saw that he pressed the buttons to, you know, like how to operate it. So, yeah, that helped us. I think that helped him more. Yeah. And did it help you? It absolutely it, did. Yeah, it yeah, did. Yeah. yeah, we. I think we um, also have been very transparent with Devanj um, all throughout. We uh, sort of put a bit of effort um, into sort of prepping him in advance yeah. um, and sort of coaching him what to expect uh, just so that he's very comfortable. Uh, look, I must say that there's been um, really high emotional intelligence within the multidisciplinary team, uh, which has gone a far way uh, of, of not only helping us, but, but making Devanch feel very comfortable. Yeah. And when you say emotional intelligence, tell me what you mean, perhaps some examples. Just um, being very, very patient with kids. Yeah. Uh, sort of, you know, we had our, um, the oncologist who took care of us, Dr. Jennifer Chan, who, who visited us quite often when we, before the treatment, when we were admitted in hospital, having chemotherapy. So she sort of, I feel that she sort of built that, that bridge um, and, you know, um, sort of removed any barriers beforehand. I, th I thought that was very nice and sort of gave, at least, I would like to think, gave Devanch a comfort level with her. Uh, and just being, yeah, very patient. The whole nursing staff and the uh, radiation um, technicians, they've been very patient with us because um, we had a few runs um, and, and just being open, being, you know, very, um, uh, not very formal with us. I thought that really helped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it felt like we were with friends, to be honest. Like a family. Yeah, and yeah. family. Gee, that's a tribute, isn't it? Hey, yeah. I mean, we're, we're working people, having a culture where people feel like friends. That's not easy, is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And 
I'd really like to thank Dr Jennifer Chard and her team at the Cancer Centre for Children at Westmead for giving us access uh, during a pandemic and of course the family who you'll hear from more uh, on Thursday the 3rd of June, Thursday the 3rd of June at 7.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, when we look at children, adolescents and young adults. And our partner then will be Cancer Voices South Australia and our, uh, my co-presenter uh, will be Vicky Bedford, who's the chair of Cancer Voices South Australia and also uh, the mother uh, of a child treated uh, with proton therapy, actually, uh, uh, in the United States. But our uh, next web next two webinars will be about conventional radiation therapy. Shona, I want to thank you for being with us for the first two. And uh, just before we bid everybody farewell, uh, you could see the emotion in those parents, couldn't you? How are your parents who, I think, supported you when you went to Prague? Yeah, I think it's definitely an emotional journey for everyone in the family. Um, and we're really lucky here in South Australia, we have access to things like Youth Cancer Service and um, Red Kite and Canteen that also provide services to family members. So my sisters also have access to support through them. So we've got excellent services here. Fantastic. Well, look, I, I know we'll work together again, Shona, but again, thank you so much for being with us for this first two of our webinars on how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. Two more to go. And thank you to everybody who's been with us tonight. And don't forget, just Google Samri webinar. You'll go through to the YouTube channel where all these interviews will be, and you can put comments there uh, under those videos. See you next time.